All right. Our third question, Austin, as COVID has forced a lot of people into their home gyms, what is a good way to set up an at-home training program? Right on. So as I do, um, I overthought and I tried to prepare my best um, sort of points to just give you some ways to just think about it. Um, So I didn't want to give stats and reps. Um, so this advice can be useful for yourself, um, considering these factors for your clients. Uh, but my, my ultimate goal over the next, hopefully 10 minutes or so. Um, so saddle up, take a drink, um, maybe pause, take a break if you need it, uh, is basically not to give you exact sets and reps, but to expand your lines of thought. Uh, so I want to potentially give you some new ways of considering these challenges we all face, right? So either for yourself or for your clients as coaches, this has been a interesting challenge. Um, I know as physique development, we've written hundreds of at-home programs and we were not that used to doing it beforehand. Um, I know I wasn't. Uh, and so now though, with some of these strategies, some of these things, some of these lines of thought, um, that I'm going to kind of lay out for you, uh, it's, it's opened up a lot of possibilities and it's taken where I was otherwise really nervous and scared and because I, w- I was just attacking it in the same way that sort of, again, it, go back, it goes back to like managing expectations. I was, I was expecting us to just absolutely replicate what we were able to do in the gym, have that much variety, uh, et cetera. All right. So we're stuck at home, um, whether you or your clients. Uh, I know in some states we, we have gym access, but I know in others we, we definitely don't. And, and I don't know when that's going away. Right. And there's absolutely some of my clients uh, that have chosen to stay home. Right. So uh, even with limited equipment, they've chosen to stay home um, for their own, you know, for their own choices. Right. So I think the first question we really need to answer here and the first question we need to ask ourselves and or our clients is what is your setup? What's your situation? Like, what does it look like? Right. So you know, when people come in to work with us, we're getting photos of your training space. We're getting inventory lists of what you have available, right? So do you have bands? Do you have access to dumbbells, barbells? Do you have a full on home gym, you know, like the Bush household does, which is retrofitted with the the best, um, and sufficient loads to basically accumulate volume and strength in any phase. So, um, which is an awesome situation to be in, right? But each one of these are challenges that we face in each one of these, whether it's yourself programming for yourself or programming for clients, right? Um, And so you're going to be, understand this, you're going to be limited by the equipment um, and access to resistance that's in front of you, right? So that's gonna limit you to some degree. Some are a lot less limited than others, but some are quite limited, right? So if you're in the camp of a low amount of weights or resistance available, so in the body weight bands, you know, lighter dumbbells camp, I would encourage you to kind of choose a goal that best matches those resources, right? So have that conversation either with yourself or with your clients and set realistic expectations, right? This goes back to setting measurable, smart goals. Um, So we, we're not expecting to, to move the world, right? When we, we have little tools available to do so. All right. So this is going to keep you in a mindset of progression rather than regression, which I think is very, very important, right? So if we need to choose goals, we need to choose our expectations wisely. That way we're always sort of moving productively towards a mindset of progression rather than regression. Okay. So ultimately we're trying to manage expectations for ourselves or for our clients. All right. So I'm going to kind of lay out, um, again, there were so many ways I could have attacked this, um, but I'm going to lay out some things that I've been utilizing with clients. And I know we as physical development has been, have been utilizing with clients who only have access to lighter resistance via dumbbells, body weight, or bands. All right. So first off, we've chosen a goal that matches the resistance we have available. I mentioned that this isn't the time to focus on getting really, really strong, this is going to be a good time to sort of run through maybe some metabolic style work alongside some maintenance 
focused work, right? So we know that to maintain a certain level of muscle tissue, right? This isn't to say you, you're not going to lose some strength. This isn't to say that you're not going to lose some muscle tissue in the short term. But we know that with a lower than you think amount of volume, as long as we're working at a certain uh, level of intensity and proximity to failure, we can hang on to a lot of adaptations more than you would think, right? So don't lose hope, don't lose faith. Um, but we need to be sure that we're setting our sights on something that's realistic and that's manageable. Keep your split higher frequency based, right? So if you only have access to uh, bands, body weight, or light dumbbells, we want to keep that split higher frequency based, which means you're training muscle groups more often during the week, right? So instead of training, let's say chest once per week or glutes once per week, um, you're going to be training those, like if you're training four days and you don't have that many, you know, you don't have that much load, it may be smart that maybe all four days you get some glute work in there or chest work in there, or maybe two out of those four, right? Depending on how much resistance and how much volume you're sort of attributing to those days, how long are those sessions um, and, and how hard are those sessions and how many, what levels of variety, um, what tools of, available do we have during those sessions, okay? So your training split in this situation, um, if it is higher frequency, could be something like an upper lower with a rest and then an upper lower and then a rest. Right? So you don't always have to work off a seven-day framework or a five-day training week. Um, you can just have a split that just sort of repeats itself. Um, and so you know, if you're not locked into needing to train only Monday through Fridays, you can customize that. right? Or if you are and you have a set number of days you can train and when you, you know when you can't train, then set your split accordingly to that. Right? So a higher frequency, when I mean that, when I say higher frequency though, I just basically mean hitting those muscle groups more often. So that typically looks like an upper lower sp split or something that we like to use is like an anterior posterior split, right? So training the front of the body one day, that includes upper and lower. And then the, the second day we train the posterior, the back, right? So back, um, hamstrings, glutes, calves, things like that, uh, which has been, again, it can kind of change up the monotony of an upper lower split if you um, you want to do that. And also you're, um, you're able to stimulate more big muscle groups on consecutive days, right? So keeping us or allowing us to, to train bigger tissues more often, um, which is going to be advantageous for us, um, especially just staying in shape, staying healthy, keeping those tissues stimulated, um, accordingly. And, uh, next point here, um, if you or your clients have limited time or simply can't endure the monotony, um, you can, again, bias more volume to larger muscle groups and larger movement patterns, right? So thinking like compound movements, uh, multi-joint movements. This is gonna train more muscle tissue overall per session compared to if I were to just do a session where I was like, okay, arm curls, lateral raises, um, things like that, right? So focusing more on like large movement patterns, hitting large amounts of tissue. Um, so in compound movements, doing those large movement patterns, you're always gonna get overlapping volume on smaller muscle groups as they act as synergists or helpers to the larger muscle groups, right? So an example here is your biceps receiving some overlapping volume in something like a pull down or a row, um, or your glutes getting some volume alongside the quads and, and the calves are being kind of touched on in like a squat pattern, for example. Um, that's going to be sort of a good way to attack it uh, if you don't, if you're kind of just stuck and you're not sure. Think about it a little bit more broadly like that and you can sort of start to break things down. And this is where we start to disassociate movements with muscles, right? So we think of like, okay, well, it's leg day, so I have to bench, or I have to do this, or I have to do this, or, um, or it's chest day. Did I say leg day? It's chest day. So I have to, okay. Um, so if you want to bench on leg day, that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, but like I was basically trying to say, if it's leg day, 
you know, you think of legs, okay, I have to squat, or you think of chest day, okay, I have to bench. Well, if you don't have very much equipment, you may not have that many options, right? So more or less thinking of like muscles we need to train rather than movements we need to train, right? So thinking more broadly can really open up a lot of variety for you, okay? Um, we also add th components outside of fitness or outside of, I mean, outside of the gym, right? So also adding components of fitness outside of the gym, things like running, cycling, hiking, swimming, walking, um, what are some other things that we can really focus on that aren't like resistance training gym related? Um, and so during, again, however long this period of time is for you, right? So if you know, let's say you have an end in sight, like, okay, I know I'm spending th the next three months kind of at home. Um, and then I want to return back to the gym in three months, right? This is a great time to really focus on maintenance within your training. Um, doing the things that I kind of mentioned previously, and then also pairing that sort of think of like concurrent training where we're pairing something like an aerobic sort of based goal with a training based goal of sort of maintenance or, um, something of the same sort of response or adaptation than we, that we're trying to gain, um, from the aerobic work, but with resistance training, right? So, um, focusing on a goal outside of the gym is really, really good. And it's been really productive, um, for a lot of people that we work with, uh, again, things like running, cycling, hiking, swimming, walking, um, going kayaking, like whatever you're into. Um, but trying to keep something or trying to keep it fitness related or activity related, um, going towards a new goal, right? So, you know, Alex and Sue both mentioned, um, within the, female muscle growth portion that it's important to have goals outside of like directly building muscle, right? So having performance-based goals, strength-based goals, things like that, right? So this is a kind of under the same line of thought, um, but it exists within sort of like aerobic goals, which is going to benefit you long-term um, once you return back to the gym, right? Lastly here, I want to mention um, potentially just picking up a new hobby, right? So if you're normally training six days a week in the gym or five days a week or whatever it is, and you're now training three days a week because you, ha you do have limited equipment, um, whether you can only bear three days of training and or you really want to focus on, you have another goal, right? So you're doing three days of resistance training. Um, you have an aerobic based goal you're working on. Um, or you just have, you know, you're going to have more free time overall to do fun activities, right? So much room for activities. So we can potentially pick up a new hobby, right? So this can be fitness or non-fitness related. I would encourage everyone to have a non-fitness related hobby or non sort of related to your profession, right? So if we're speaking to trainers here, when you go around the room and someone asks you what your hobbies are and you say, and you're a personal trainer and you say, one of my hobbies is resistance training. We, that's not a really good answer. Like we need something outside of that, right? You need to be more well-rounded in that way and get yourself out of your profession. Get yourself out of what you do day in and day out um, and this can be in the form of a new hobby, right? So I do believe that fitness should be a, a large part of your life. Um, I do believe fitness is a very important puzzle piece um, throughout your life, but I don't think it's the sole focus or should be the sole focus of every aspect or every sort of chapter of your life, if that makes sense. Okay, so as long as we're keeping things in check, right? So we're getting a certain maintenance level of training if that's desired, um, and then as long as we have nutrition, sleep and stress management in check and our mental health in check, half of what you're doing before, um, is still going to be productive within the gym or, or at your at home workouts and it's going to keep you healthy. Okay. So picking whether that's, you know, whatever that is playing the guitar, maybe starting to read more, um, picking up a different type of modality, like picking up yoga, um, whatever that is, right. But 
it needs to be, if you are a trainer, I would really encourage you to pick up something that is outside of your profession, something you do every single day, right? Challenge the mind in new ways. Um, the last thing, um, or one of the last things, I'm a liar, I am a liar. Um, one of the last things here, um, basically going to, uh, and I wanna have these guys weigh on this uh, after I mention it, um, cause they, I know they ran into, as they were building out their home gym, they ran into uh, some things with having access to enough load, um, but it was very limited as far as the variety of the way the body was being loaded, right? So um, some of us have invested into squat racks, barbells, um, dumbbells, like free weights, right? And um, the volume utilizing only barbells and free weights it's a bit different than the volume coming from the combination of like free weights, machines, cables, as you're probably used to training in the gym, right? It's just going to hit a bit different. And there's some other things that you have to keep in mind. Okay. So this comes down to where, where in the range of motion or where in that muscle or the range of that muscle, range of motion of that muscle rather, sorry, where's that being most challenged, right? Where in the movement is that being most challenged? alongside how that load is being received by your body. Right? So for example, in a leg press, your spine is not being loaded. In a back squat, it is. In a barbell lunge, it is. In something like an RDL, it is. But in like something like a seated leg curl, uh, lying, or lying leg curl, leg extension, your spine isn't gonna be as loaded. And it's gonna be challenging in a different part of that range of motion for your muscle, right? So. It does matter and it does make a difference and you're going to know it does hit a bit different, right? You could equate volume, but it's going to feel different, right? So you have to be able to sort of pivot, understand, and sort of manage those variables a bit more. Um, so you can't simply go from all that volume maybe you're potentially doing in the gym with variable resistance with machines, free weights, and cables, and basically move all that over to only working with like free weights, like barbells and dumbbells, for example. So I know you guys kind of ran into those issues. Um, what was kind of your experience with that and how quickly did it hit different um, when you had to go straight barbell, dumbbell work relative to like machine-based stuff and cable-based stuff? Yeah, I'll have Alex hit on that and then I have Two, three other points I want to hit on real quick. So. Um, well, when we first got the squat rack and the dumbbells in, um, I was, I mean, having a home gym is something that I've always wanted since I was a, a kid to begin with. So I was obsessed with just going out there and playing with it for the most part. Um, so for like the first couple of weeks, I was squatting every day. <laughs> Or benching randomly. Yeah, like Corey day. Gregory squatted every yeah, day. Yeah, I literally was just so excited to have it out there that I would just go out there and bench or squat. And it was not a good habit for me to take a break from work and just go out there and do random exercises for 30 or 45 minutes and then come back in. And I was doing it two or three times a day. So um, that beat me up pretty quickly. Uh, but past that, in actual program design, loading the spine as frequently as we were, we were pretty beat up and had to back off of the total volume as well as frequency as a whole um, just because of just the the beat down and heavier loading that we hadn't had because we had been training with bands for you know a few months at that point or a month or so mm -hmm. yeah um, and it's something that a lot of people don't take into consideration of like how much is my spine being loaded and it was something that even if someone could do an exercise or work a muscle group with a barbell or a dumbbell or something like that I would put in something else and they'd be like well I can do that with a barbell why am I not doing that and it was talking about all right spinal health and putting yourself under that much load all the time is very very hard on your body so we had to deload a lot sooner than we expected we had to take breaks a lot sooner than we expected expected. Um, we had to have less volume. Um, so just definitely something to keep in mind. But the few points that I'll say as far as home training goes, it gives you a great time to focus on execution. It's very easy to get caught up in like, 
grind all day. I'm going to hit PRs every time I step into the gym. And now that you don't have as much accessibility and you're working out in the comfort of your own home, you're not having to work worry about how your workout is being perceived as others, which I feel like is a downfall for many people. Many people get themselves into a less than advantageous situation because they're training in front of people and they want to present themselves a certain way. And I have 100% gotten looped into this. Let's say I'm do- doing a metabolic phase, so I'm not lifting as heavy as I would in a neurological phase. And then someone walks in the gym and I start to feel inferior because, oh, I'm a female in the gym and they're judging me. And then I'm just going to put more weight on the bar. Um, But I didn't run into that because no one was watching me at home. Um, And it was something where I could film myself without having to worry about being embarrassed for filming myself um, and really get good at some execution for some different movements. So it gives you that time to get out of that gym mentality um, and be able to really hone in on your execution and nail that down. So when you do get back in the gym, you are good to go. Um, Another thing here, is being able, like Austin said, of finding a different hobby um, and finding different ways to move your body. I had clients even with the fires going on that couldn't even go outside to walk with the air quality. And I was like, what else do you like to do? Um, And one of them said dancing. So we found some dance videos for them to do and being able to move their body in that way. Um, And with that, I also really honed in on association, which Austin talked about this in forms of goal setting. And it's the same with a lot of aspects of your life. But Do not try and train if you can help it in a room that you don't want that association with. So I found clients coming into the point of, oh my gosh, I do not want to train. I'm so discouraged. And I'm like, where are you training? Be like, oh, in my bedroom or in my living room or wherever it may be. And I know that's like some spaces you just might not have enough space, but I always encourage clients to go outside and that changed it big time for some of my clients. If they had the availability to train in a garage or outside on a deck or just outside on the sidewalk, because that didn't have the association. If I'm in my living room, I'm relaxing. I am trying to not do work. I am trying to calm down. And if I try to do weightlifting in my living room, I will never get into the right mentality. Um, So it's something that not trying to copy the gym verbatim, like Austin mentioned, um, but also being able to form a new association Um, and maybe even keeping some of those same habits. Like I talked about within habit forming of like, I'm going to get my pre-workout. I'm putting on my gym clothes. I'm going to go do this thing instead of like, oh, well, it's just in my garage. Like who cares how I set myself up? Because those steps do matter. Um, And the last thing I'll touch on is that it gives you time time to focus on your health and focus on other aspects of fitness. So I had a lot of clients running into before everything got shut down of, oh, I'm always going out to eat or getting really wrapped up in the social aspect. And it gave them time to truly realize, all right, how do I actually like to eat? What serves me? What does food mean to me? Be able to try out new recipes that maybe you didn't have time for before, um, as well as to really hone in on being consistent. And so that was a main thing. If clients didn't have accessibility or they're really Really worn down when it came to training, being able to look at it as far as, okay, let's not think about training right this second. Let's think about food and how we can get that in the absolute best spot. How can we fine tune your meal prepping? And a lot of clients got really good at meal prepping. So when it went back to normal life, if you want to call it that, um, they had new skills that they were able to take forward and be more efficient and be able to rock and roll in that aspect. So looking at it from multifaceted, so many people get into like, all right, here's my normal routine. And when your normal routine gets halted, you have to think outside the box and you have to challenge your separate ways of thinking. You might think every time I go in the gym, I lift as heavy as I freaking can. Well, now you can't go in the gym and now you can't lift as heavy as you can. So what is that new challenge going to tell you about yourself or about your goals? Or how can you use that to achieve your goals in a different way? Well, you got it, Alex. That was all good. <laughs> I've got nothing to add. That was fantastic. Um, I'm excited for everybody to get back in the gym when they can. <laughs> yeah. So I got a quick checklist really quick um, that I'll go through and um, that'll kind of end us out here. So I'm going to go over this checklist. We'll end with any thoughts that we may have um, based off this checklist that I th- think is rather complete. Obviously, it's going to have um, these checklists could be t- 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 10 pages long, but I want to keep it short, sweet, um, and on behalf of you trying to um, address alongside things that Alex mentioned and or Sue mentioned, um, 
these are some things that at least will check some boxes for you and maybe allow you to think a little differently about how you're approaching your home workouts, right? So number one on the list is, we'll go back to what type of resistance do you have available, right? So this is gonna dictate the type of exercises possible um, for you along with those exercises um, and how those are gonna stress the body. Okay, so where are those most loaded? Do they load the spine? Um, All of those things, right? This will also dictate your training split, right? So the less resistance you have available, the more high frequency you should go, meaning you should train muscles, muscle groups more often in the week, most typically, right? This is gonna be individual. Um, And this is more or less applicable to those with really light loads like body weight or um, resistance bands or really light dumbbells or or things like that. Um, As you know, these guys mentioned, it's, it's important that you know, if you do have a little heavier equipment, um, that volume is going to hit a bit different and you got to be ready for that. And you have to sort of pivot and adjust, uh, and to accommodate that sort of different type of resistance, um, that your body's going to face, right? So, um, the more load, the less frequency you may be able to train with and the more frequent you frequently, um, you may have to deload. For example, the second one on the list that I want to mention is how are you recovering from that training, right? So this this is going to dictate what progressions can be, um, or what can bre- what progressions can be made, and what regressions may need to take place, right? So if you started out a little too ambitious, um, you may need to regress in something, right? So whether that was a movement pattern, or the amount of volume, or the amount of density, so the amount of work done in a given amount of time, right? So maybe you need to lengthen your rest periods more than you originally thought. So um, a lot of at-home workout variations include, well, let's just do everything, but do it faster um, or do it with less rest. And depending on what you're using and how you're sort of stressing your body in that certain instance, you still may need some rest. It's okay to rest. Rest isn't Rest isn't something that works against us necessarily. Um, You just kind of have, it's going to depend on that goal. Um, And so just because you are training at home or just because you're in a different environment doesn't sort of negate the importance of appropriate rest, okay? So depending on what resistance you have, the volume could impact you differently and depending on what you are using or what you're used to, okay? The third one is going to be progressing loads or intensity through the weeks. So how to achieve progressive overload. Okay, so some quick notes here. Um, This has a wide range of possibilities. So you could increase reps, you could increase load if possible, you could change your tempo, you could progress a variation. So you could go from a um, a push-up where you are just a normal push-up to a push-up where your feet are elevated, right? So that's going to make you train or lift more of your body weight um, per rep, right? I think it's a difference of uh, push-ups are somewhere close to like 55% of your body weight or maybe close there, Um, but feet elevated on like a 12 inch box ramps that up to like 74%, 75% of your body weight, right? So that's a progression. Um, And that could be sort of a a part of progressive overload in in a way. Okay, you could change your tempo. Okay, you could do longer eccentrics or more time spent where those reps are hardest, right? So um, if that's a, a squat, maybe you just kind of change your tempo a bit, maybe add a pause in that lengthened position, that bottom position. Um, and those are things that you would do kind of over the weeks. You could alter your rest time between sets, as I mentioned. You could go from straight sets to supersets. You could add more sets of a given exercise. Um, Again, the options are vast here. All I will say is if you're going to make these progressions, do it one at a time and see how your body responds, right? So don't make every, everything I said, don't do all that. Go from week one where you're normal and then go to week two where you just made all of those adjustments, right? Um, Choose one or two and sort of stick with that. See how that does for you, how your body responds, how you recover, um, and how you're adapting over the weeks, right? Because these adaptations are not going to be instantaneous. Um, That doesn't change whether we're training at the gym or at home. 
And the last thing, the final thing I want to mention, um, or the second to last thing, <laughs> just lying today. The second to last thing, um, can you choose a goal outside of your resistance training to focus on? Okay, so adding an aerobic based goal during this time, uh, working on your health. Uh, as Sue said, uh, is a great thing, um, working on different aspects, but this can be a great idea and a way for you to even sort of be even better off when you're able to return back to the gym or back into your quote unquote, more normal routine. Lastly, is there a hobby that you can, uh, that you've always wanted to try that you just haven't had time for? Okay. So this could be anything from reading to playing guitar to knitting, right? Um, gaining back hours in your week during this time can be utilized to sort of expand your interests, um, increase the challenges on your mind that weren't possible in your in the routine you were in previous, right? So a lot of options here. Um, and that was a brief checklist, but those are just some things that could just sort of change your line of thought. Um, maybe expand the way you're considering something, um, either for yourself or for your clients.